Professor G. What do we got today? What do you want to talk about? So we've got another edition of one of these things is not like the other today. So I have three pictures here. Maybe I'll let the viewers linger for a moment and see if they come up with their own ideas. Definitely got like a spiral galaxy look happening here. So spiral galaxy is a good guess because we have made literally hundreds of videos on objects that look like these. And in fact, two of these objects are spiral galaxies. So the usual thing that we talk about collections of hundreds of billions of stars and gas and dust, beautiful spiral pattern way out in the distant universe. But one of them is a more local phenomenon. It's this one. It is a bit more diffuse. That it is one. a bit more diffuse, but it, 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 it could pass for sure. And indeed, this is something that rather than being a tiny, tiny thing that you need a telescope to see very faint in, in the sky, this is one of these oh my God, what is that thing in the sky kind of phenomenon. And it's something that's happening more and more frequently. And that's because rather than being an astronomical object, it's an atmospheric object. And in fact, it is formed from the condensation of propellant from the upper stage of a rocket launch. And because these rocket launches are happening more frequently and because so many more people carrying around phones and video cameras in their, in their pockets, we now regularly get stories and images and videos of these phenomena being seen in the sky. One of the first ones I ever saw was actually this one, which was pretty spectacular. This happened in Norway in 2009. And I have to be honest, I am not sure what my reaction would be if I saw that in the sky. I hope I would put my logical brain on and, and say, something interesting is happening up there. I wonder what the physics is behind that. What would your illogical brain my, say? My illogical brain would be, be thinking, my God, that's a portal to another dimension or we're being visited by aliens. <laughs> So what's there to say about this? What's going on? Why doesn't every rocket do it? Or what makes it happen? Or what, what are we looking at? So to see a phenomenon like this, you need a couple of criteria to align. If you're going to view it from the Earth, you need to be viewing it at the right angle. You need to be viewing it at the right time. It's usually around twilight, because what you're seeing are ice crystals that are reflecting sunlight in the very upper atmosphere. It's a very short-lived phenomenon, so you need to see it shortly after the rocket has launched. The kind of rockets that produce this are two-stage rockets. And I meant to bring a rocket and I forgot. Do you have any dry erase markers here? <laughs> right, so the kind of rocket that produces this is a two-stage rocket. So it's got two separate stages, each with its own fuel supply and its own engine. The first stage, the booster, is responsible for getting it up. So getting it to a sufficient velocity and a sufficient altitude, and then it's done its job. And then it usually detaches. This first stage then falls back to Earth, and, and now technology is sufficiently sophisticated that it can be caught and reused and used again another time. So now we've got the second stage, which is carrying the payload, the thing that you're actually trying to get into orbit. This engine ignites, and the job of the second stage is to get the payload into the appropriate orbital parameters, wherever it's meant to be. Cygnus separation confirmed. When that happens, payload goes off and does its thing. Now you're left with the second stage. This isn't going to be reused, so it's got to come back down to Earth, but it's got to come back down to Earth safely. So it's going to have a little bit of leftover fuel, a little lef leftover propellant, because you always build in a margin of error. We don't want to leave it in the stage because uh, of risk of overpressurization -press could explode. If it explodes, you've spread debris all over that, uh, that level of the atmosphere, which is very, very bad. So the next job for this stage is to get rid of that excess propellant. And so yes, the rocket is often spinning to stabilize it. The excess propellant, uh, which would be liquid ox oxygen and uh, refined rocket grade kerosene, in most cases, not all cases, um, will be uh, ejected often from the side. And as it spins, this propellant comes out, we're now up several hundred kilometers, so we're in near vacuum. This, uh, this propellant comes out and it immediately freezes. And so most of these phenomena that you're seeing are pretty much frozen oxygen. So the liquid oxygen, the oxidizer for your engine, that propellant being sprayed out while the rocket is traveling forward and spinning. And so it, it travels very rapidly, but it also diffuses very rapidly. I don't have an exact time scale, but it's not going to last a very, very long time. 
and it's also going to appear to be moving across the sky as the rocket travels away. So you're seeing something in the sky that's both rotating, changing, and moving across the sky. And none of those things are, are, are usually what we expect to see when we look up in the sky. This doesn't sound good for the environment. Like, should we be worried about this? So the answer is no, not really. Uh, we're talking about a few, maybe 10 kilograms of propellants left over from, you know, a ton, ton and a half uh, in that stage. It's not burnt, it's unburnt. So it's, it's not been a, a product of combustion. And it really is dispersing up into the level of the exosphere where you're at full vacuum. So it's just being spread out and then uh, probably sublimating very quickly because of the, the solar uh, radiation. So in that sense, it's not so bad. What is worth considering though, is the products of all of the combustion that took the rockets up to that stage and the number of rockets that are now being launched on a regular basis. I'm not gonna quantify that in this video, but it's something that as we develop into a more spacefaring species, it's just something that has to be accounted for. All right, what are you going to show us now? Okay, well, since we're here, since we're in the, the uh, physics department, it's always fun to play with liquid nitrogen. Um, so we've got Paul here, who is a whiz with liquid nitrogen, and I know he's got a demo up his sleeve that really illustrates this in a fun way. So I'm going to hand over to Paul. Let's do it, Paul. So first we're going to fill it up with propellant, which in this case is liquid nitrogen. So it's very cold, so it's turned into a liquid. Okay, that's probably about enough. Once we take that out of the liquid, the liquid immediately wants to boil and expand. And so when we put it down, the two little holes on either side turn into little mini jets. And the liquid is propelled out and we see this condensing vapor in these beautiful spiral patterns, just like we see with the venting propellant from the rockets in the upper atmosphere. How would a compass needle know to point at the geographic north or south pole? In fact, they don't. The magnetic north pole and the magnetic south pole that our compasses point towards are actually in a different place altogether. And in fact, that place actually moves. So to understand what's going on here, you really have to understand how the magnetic field of the Earth is formed in the first place. 